Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to a special Friday edition of the Dirt to Dust Mailbag, where we will take we will take no mail. There will be no bag. There will be no mail. There will be no mailbag because today um, we have decided to go with a special edition of Dirt to Dust presented by Outlaw Off-Road. Everybody, Caleb, is buzzing. The world is buzzing. It is on fire. The social medias, the Facebooks, the Instagrams with the release of the all new 2025 generation six Toyota four runner. Um, I'm pretty excited about it. We saw the video immediately. We decided we needed to do an episode on it. So, uh, yeah, so here we are, we're ready to talk about it. I've got a lot of notes. I know you got a lot of notes. I know a lot of people I've already seen questions popping up some things that I noticed during the video. So, um, yeah, so generation six Toyota four runner released the 2025 Toyota four runner. Pretty excited about it. We're going to do an episode all about the release. So let's get into it right now. When other people see dirt, you see glory. And when you see a vehicle for the first time, your first thought is not how pretty it is, but how much abuse can it take? This is Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off-Road. If it's anything off-road and dirty, we probably like it, and we're probably talking about it. You'll get industry info, tech talk, and interviews with the biggest and best in the industry. Let's do it. This is Dirt to Dust. And now your hosts, Doug Langford and Caleb Forbes. All right, all right, and okay. Here we are. We are back. We are ready to go with the special edition episode of Dirt to Dust for the release of the new Generation 6 Toyota 4Runner. <laughs> oh, I, this I'm, is dude, I'm pretty excited about this. this. Super exciting. Man, it has been, what has it been, like 97 and a half years since Toyota's released a new version of the 4Runner? Oh, it certainly feels like that. Certainly Jeez. feels like it. Um, I mean, it feels like we're finally stepping into the 21st century with the 4Runner, which is pretty freaking awesome. And I'm in, I'm, I'm for one like, really it's excited. Fine. For it. It's bit man. I mean, the, it, it felt like, I think when the forerunner, the gen five came out, it was kind of ahead of its time. It was not, not that they changed the suspension that much from the, from the gen four, but the way the aesthetics of it looked from the, from the gen four and certainly from the gen three, it felt like it was ahead of its time. And then like, you know, Toyota and their infinite, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. They just kind of left it alone for like the better part of 15 years. Like they did one little kind of mid gen refresh on the body, but they really didn't do much. Like the interior was, the interior was mad. The suspension was mad, but you know, it has, I mean, people, you think Jeep has a loyal following. Say something bad about a forerunner to a Toyota person. Oh no, you're <laughs> going to, you'll get the flack. Oh, you're going to catch them hands. They will yeah. throw hands. And <laughs> You know, I've owned a couple of them. I've owned a couple of four owners. They're really nice vehicles. Um, and and if you if you find yourself in need of one of a vehicle that does what a forerunner does, you know, you're hard pressed to beat it, except for the last couple of years when everybody was just kind of like in this laissez faire. Uh, we got the same forerunners last year. I got the same forerunners last year. So really, really excited. I know they've been working on it. I know COVID hurt them. I know all that stuff. I get it. The Toyota people are gonna yell at me about the reasons why Toyota took so long. I hear you. I get it. Um, but we don't have to talk about that anymore because here we are in April of 2024. We've got the release. We know what's coming. It is now official. We've seen the pictures. We've seen the specs. We've seen the trims. We've seen the model. We, we know all of that now. So we are now going to dedicate the next half hour of our lives to talk about it. So yeah, I kind of want to start off with let's kind of kick it back a little bit. I started to touch on it a little bit about what we didn't like kind of about the Generation 5. Um, and I had two of them. I had one of the Gen 5s, kind of the early Gen 5s. It was a 13. And then I had a 19. Uh, it was a TRD Pro, so kind of the newer the newer body style. Right. Um, not that there was anything, you know, about that. And <laughs> Pretty much the same vehicle. They, they were. I mean, exterior-wise, a couple little tweaks on the interior. And for me, that was the big thing. Like, the interiors just kind of, they were underwhelming is an understatement. I just wasn't a fan and when we looked at it 
when we looked at Forerunner versus other vehicles, you, you got to want a Forerunner, right? Like, you know, the reason we bought our first one was, you know, back then she wasn't my wife, but now she is. And I asked her, this was, this is 10 years ago. I said, you know, what's your, what's your dream vehicle? And she said, a Toyota Forerunner. And without batting an eye. And, you know, like six months later, we bought her a Forerunner. Um, then shortly after that, we got married. Things changed. We bought another vehicle. She regretted that purchase after the Forerunner when we got rid of the Forerunner. And we went back to a Forerunner uh, five years after that. We bought that one in 14. Then we bought another one new uh, in 2019. She fell in love with the Voodoo Blue. Ooh. Um, yeah. It's a good it's color. A good color. It's a good mm-hmm. color. Um, and we bought the, at that year, you could only get Voodoo Blue in the TRD Pro. So we bought the TRD Pro and then proceeded to build the ever loving life out of that thing with like, Long travel, long arm suspension, coil over bypass, you know, advanced fiber, you know, concepts, um, fiberglass fenders. Like it, that thing got stupid. It had 35s, beadlocks. It was all the things. It was nuts. Um, so I've kind of had those, you know, one extreme um, to the other. But the interior was a big thing for me. And then just kind of the overall combo of power. Like I, I felt like they were really, really under geared from the factory. And I felt like the engines which some of it came from the gearing, just felt underpowered for what they could have been. Um, the 4.0 was a very, very reliable engine, um, but I think it was very, very, a combination of underpowered versus undergeared. Some of that you could fix, but it never really, it always felt like that engine was being like harnessed and not in a good yep. way. Um, yeah. So those were my two, those were my big two things that I didn't like about it. I don't know if yours are the same or different. On that um, yeah, pretty much the same. Uh, I was actually in the market for a forerunner uh, a couple of years ago, and I test drove probably four or five of them, different trim levels, different budget options um, from a SR5 up to, I want to say I tried a TRD or TRD Pro, um, and I had the same complaints. Um, I was looking at that between that or getting a, a JL and uh, even a sport model JL uh, for S. Sorry, felt more comfortable and felt like it had more creature comforts than the Toyota, um, which is especially. Wild. And I didn't really fit. Yeah, and I didn't really fit comfortably in the Toyota either. I'm I'm a bigger dude. I'm I'm six foot tall. I'm kind of lanky, big dude. Um, it just it didn't feel like it was made for bigger dudes (laughs) i know that's that's not something a lot of people are going to base their purchase off but i just didn't fit comfortably in it um i didn't see myself driving that long like on a long road trip um but looking at everything just felt super plasticky uh i just i just was underwhelmed and then for the price point being more expensive than the jl which the jl was already more expensive like more expensive than i really wanted to pay anyways and then not to mention the power and uh the uh the wonderful Toyota transmission that likes to hunt for gears. Um, I just, I didn't love it. And I it really put a bad taste in my mouth. Cause like, man, this looks like such a cool vehicle from the outside. It could be so well built, but then you get in and you're like, ah, but now I think, I think Toyota did exactly what Jeep did and listened to their customer base and said, you know what? We'll, uh, we'll make some updates and we'll make some changes. I, I, I would agree with that to an extent. I think, you know, Toyota was always very upfront and said, look, in the in our TRD models, we are not going to put a lot of these creature comforts. We feel that the TRD customer, and I've said this in a previous episode, uh, the one I did alone when I talked about the Forerunner, we feel that customer is an off-road customer only. They don't want these comforts, and we're not going to put them in there. And I disagree with that a thousand percent. Um, the, that is not, that that was, I think, where the market was when, the Gen 5 originally came out, but their kind of refusal to update and their, their kind of stoicism about this is what we're going to do and we don't really care. We're just kind of kind of take our lumps and this is because they were selling vehicles like they have a loyal following. I think they could have sold more, but I think finally it looks like to me with some of the stuff that we'll go into here in a moment, it looks like to me they've said, okay, we're uncle. <laughs> we give up a little bit, a little, <laughs> not crazy. Like there's still some delineation yeah. for sure between um, the Platinum and the Limited, their their premium trims, what they call them, and, you know, like the new Trail Hunter trim and the TRD Pro, for sure. And and there should be. But as I've said many times before, and we've talked about it here, the market, where the market is and where the market's going is, I want it to look like it can do crazy stuff, even if mm-hmm. I'm not going to make it. You know, there's a reason that companies are charging thousands of dollars for, like, black badges, that's a sporty look. Like, it doesn't cost any more to make a black badge, but people are paying for it. I did it on my truck 
you know, my truck, you know, an <laughs> F-350 doesn't come with black bag. You have to buy the black appearance package and it's not right. cheap, but I wanted the black. And so I just fell into that just like everybody else did. So, um, though, so I think that's where the market is. It's going to go. I don't think it's going to stop going that way. I mean, everything is cyclical, right? I know that, but I think we're, we are not at the end of that cycle right now. I think we are just now starting to see, um, maybe the first few years of it, but I think that could be the, the, the market for the next I mean, if, if history is anything to tell, it's another 10 years. We're in this. We're in this for another 10 years. So I do think that Toyota um, did, like you said, listen to their customers a little bit. And with what I'm seeing here, you know, I kind of went through that release video they put out uh, a couple nights ago. Uh, I watched it that night. I watched it again the next day, and I started looking at stuff and picking up on some of the details. And I watched it again and made some more notes right before we filmed this. So um so so let's jump in here let's talk about let's talk about the forerunner in in kind of three categories the overall kind of the you know the trims the powertrains all that kind of stuff then we'll talk about suspension and exterior and then we'll talk about uh where i think most of the changes are <clears throat> is the interior so uh let's jump right in there so toyota's calling this a thoroughly modernized forerunner um i would agree with that <laughs> yeah, I mean, they didn't go too crazy, I think, with the outside design. It looks like a natural progression from the Gen 5. Uh, I do, I did see in some profile shots and whatnot, it looked like a little bit of a nod to the Gen 4. Um, I thought it brought in some of those aesthetics, which I think is cool. I think that's fine. I mean, Jeep I, does I it, Bronco too. does it. They I'm all glad do you it. recognize that. So I think that's cool. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, um, I didn't see any, like, you know, old school Forerunner stuff in there, but I did see some nods to Gen 4 and kind of a massaged version of the Gen 5. I don't have a problem with that because the Gen 5 was a sexy-looking forerunner. Um, and to kind of mold that with some hints to the past, I thought was very, very cool. Um, they do have nine trim levels on this new forerunner. Holy crap. Holy crap. Now, half of those are TRD. You know, you got the TRD, the TRD Offer, the TRD Sport, the TRD Pro. A lot of that's TRD. The new, the new trim level, the one is new, is the uh, Trail Hunter. That's a new one. Um, it gets some, it gets some cool stuff too. Not sure that I'll be a trail hunter customer, but I think there will be a ton of people that buy that trail hunter, but that's, you know, that's a nod to what, you know, you know, Honda did with the trail sport Ford did it with the Timberline. There's a lot of companies, um, even Subaru did it with the, what they call it, the wild land or wild track or the wild something, um, adventure, all that kind of stuff. So everybody's doing it. So Toyota's going to do it too, but in true forerunner fashion, they're going to do it, um, maybe a little bit to kind of a next level. The the one thing that, that jumps out at me is the four O is gone. It, it yeah. it's, it's no more four O, and and I think that's a happy retirement. I think that's fine. Yeah, it's it's, it's time to it's retire gone. that engine. It was time um, as good as it was <laughs> years ago. It, it's there. There are just so many better engine options today, especially with right. um, non aspirated or non naturally mm -hmm. aspirated options to have a smaller, more efficient engine with a turbo that outperforms and still keeps that torque low, there's really not a need for an inline engine based off the 4.0 anymore, especially for Toyota. It was torquey. It was good, but the power band wasn't where it needed to be. So I, I, I really want to see what it this power does. Um, so if it competes with the JL 2.0 turbo at yep. all, then it's going to be a freaking monster. Especially if the, so you've got the, you got the, um, the 2.4 liter iForce. And that is a turbocharged four cylinder. That is a standard engine that's going to be available. Uh, and that is a roughly 280, 278 horsepower and 317, I think, 317 pound feet of torque. So not bad. Not bad at all. Not bad for yeah. you know, just a regular turbocharged four cylinder. That's not bad. That puts it in line with its competition. Now, we're saying these numbers and we're not sitting in them, right? Like, as you said, we have to sit in one, and, and I will, uh, to know how that power is put to the ground through what gear ratio, through what transfer, case, all of that stuff. There is a new updated transmission. We're not going with the old, you know, 1.5 speed transmission <laughs> that that thing felt like it had. Right. So all of that is upgraded too. So I think all of that, you know, new transmission, <clears throat> new gearing, all that's going to help that feel more peppy, more modern, like what we feel like an SUV should feel mm -hmm. like. Like you said, more like that, that 2.0 or that 2.0 hybrid um, in the 4xe, which <clears throat> is the next level up is their hybrid iForce Max, uh, capital letters, M-A-X, got to capitalize the All Max. the Max. Um, which ups the horsepower by almost 50. Wow. 
and ups the well yeah that's a lot of horses but it ups the torque by well over 100 like almost 150 whoa pound feet of torque that's, um, which is that hybrid that's, that's that a hybrid, hybrid engine drive. man <laughs> that's that hybrid drive man i mean you I mean, can hate on the hey, hybrid hey, all you want to drive. but the proof is in the pudding it's where the market's it, it going like going. i you know i resisted it now what do i own i own a freaking wrangler rubicon 4 by e like you know and and it like everything it has its pluses and its minuses and i'm sure the iforce max will too um but i've i've i have heard some review it's it's a new engine the iforce max is a new engine. It's not that is not something that's been out a long time it is in limited trims on the um tacoma um and it is in other toyota models to to limited effect so far but i haven't i, I just don't think toyota i just i trust toyota to put out an engine that's not going to blow up yeah i mean as um, as we have for a very long time um yeah i, I just think don't toyota see them has, putting out a crap motor yeah yeah i think toyota has set the standard across every single platform of having engines that routinely go into the three and four hundred thousand miles um with limited maintenance um and i think that that's something we always especially i mean at least me and in, in the side of the offered community that i'm in everyone always compares okay how's the reliability compared to a toyota um there's a reason right. why freaking they, they the use these things the in the desert for 40 the years uh yeah. they just keep running um so I would not put it past Toyota to continue that line and to continue to have a super reliable engine. Uh, now, do we know if this is a part or I'm sorry, a plug-in hybrid or if this is internal hybrid? You know, I, I thought that too. I saw nowhere on any of the videos and I was looking, I was saw nowhere that a plug would go. Now that is not saying that, you know, like when they released the, uh, the Tacoma, there was no iForce Max at first. Um, I don't think that's a plug in. I don't I don't think they're going to reinvent the wheel um, on. You know, I think they're going to keep the same powertrain that was in the Tacoma. I just don't see them going that way. They haven't shown they haven't shown a big willingness to do that. Um, by and large, they just they just haven't shown that. We'll see what happens in the future. Um, so my guess would be that that motor is not even available at release, much like they did with the Tacoma. Mm -hmm. Hope I'm wrong. Because I have a feeling if, if I order one, it's it's going to be with that iForce Max. But it may also be a deal where I go ahead and buy a, uh, a Tacoma or something and have that for a year and wait till, you know, kind of wait till the set. Because I don't know, you know, who knows if Toyota doesn't have limited production, kind of like the Bronco does, and dealerships are charging markups. Like, we don't know. There's a lot we don't know yet, and that's some, you know, most of that's logistic stuff. But we'll see. You know, if somebody's coming out with markups and people are paying it, I'm not doing that. I, you know, I'm not going to do that, so I'll wait. Yeah, I'll so you know, we'll see. Let the bugs. We'll get see out. what happens. Mm -hmm. I will say this: one, it, you know, I think it was overlooked a lot. They they made a comment in the release video that max power was delivered at 1700 RPMs. Wow, that's a hell of a power band. That's um, that's, that's usable low. power. That's yeah, right. Like they're not saying, oh, it's four, it's 300 horsepower at 4300 RPMs, like a lot of vehicles. Mm -hmm that you would typically think in that Japanese Asian high rev style mm -hmm. 1700 RPMs where your usable power is at is pretty impressive. That's so that's almost right. The off. 4.0 was not like that. Yeah. No. The 4.0 was not like that. The 4.0 was never like revved that. a little bit. Yeah. And that's impressive considering they've turbocharged it and it's a hybrid. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. And they said that was both on the iForce and the iForce max. So it doesn't appear that having the hybrid matters of where that usable power comes in. It seems like they've got that kind of dialed in. So pretty pretty excited about that so we got the new engines we got the new transmission um you know it's thoroughly modernized and we got nine trim levels that's gonna be like a trivia question later can you name all nine trim levels of the generation six forerunner there's it's a like lot the, of them so it's like the bronco when it came out like you have every customizable option within every yep. single trim level next thing you know and you then they added 20. more <laughs> yeah and then like, you got bro, 20 come different on, trim man. options yeah <laughs> but that's okay i mean i'm, I'm sure the customer base probably wanted options and Toyota said, okay, well, what can we give everyone in different budget options for, I guess. You know, from something comparable to the fifth gen, but moderately, modernly upgraded to the best of the best with uh, crawl control and max terrain select and every single tech option, which I want to get into later as well. Um, and they're probably trying to hit every single customer base level. And I bet you they're gunning for the Bronco. Um, Bye -bye doing yeah, that. I mean, they're gunning for the Bronco and the Wrangler. I I just don't know. I, I guess that kind of segues into the next section, and we'll just kind of jump into there because, you know, the next thing we want to talk about is exterior and um, kind of suspension stuff. 
I just don't know how I feel about that being a direct competitor to the Wrangler or the Bronco because it's not like there's a soft top versus hard top option. It's not like we're going to take off the – it's not like that. I think – Right. And and Forerunner kind of got to this, and I was happy to see them put to bed the idea of independent rear suspension where they were kind of going to put it on a different car chassis. You know, Toyota was the last body on frame SUV, true SUV, like – not the Bron- not the Bronco that, you know, with the doors off and all. The Bronco and Wrangler are their own thing. But the last of, like, the true, you know, body-on-frame SUV. Um, and, and, and I always liked it for that. And I thought it had a unique place in the market. I think it now continues to hold that place in the market uniquely because of that. Because you're still not going to take the doors off. And it's not going to be a Wrangler. It's not going to be a Bronco. But I think... I think a lot of people that don't take their doors and their tops off are, you know, a Wrangler and a Bronco, which is a large section of the market, right? Like that's a bigger section of the market um, than people want to talk about that that could slide over into a forerunner if they're out shopping and they're like, well, it's cool that I can do this with the top and it's cool that I can do this with the doors, but I'm never going to do that. So now I'm going to go test drive a forerunner where before they go drive the Bronco, they go drive the Wrangler, they go drive the forerunner. And I think the forerunner is clearly not for for daily driver people off road you can have that conversation but just daily driving it for your for your doctors or lawyers or accountants your you know soccer moms whatever i don't think the forerunner held a candle um to the interior the creature comforts all that kind of stuff when comparing it to like a wrangler rubicon or like a bronco badlands or sasquatch or yeah, something like that 100 percent agree now i think with what i'm seeing again we haven't sat mm-hmm. in we don't know what it feels like and that's a big thing from what yeah. I'm seeing, I think they are directly going at that market that Wrangler went after in 2018 and that Bronco went after in 2021. Now you're mm-hmm. going to see in 2025, Toyota's like, hey, guys, I'm here too. And, you know, I do think that some of the people at marketing and, and Stellantis for Jeep and, and for Ford are going, crap. <laughs> 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 we were really yeah, riding think- the gravy train on biscuit yeah. wheels with Toyota kind of screwing around and not changing anything because I think it was like, Oh, five, the last time they changed the suspension. So um, right. I do think they're bringing that up. You've got, you know, they're staying IFS on the front. They're staying multi-link coil on the rear. I really like that. They're kind of staying with, you know, the Bill Stein is coming in on all the TRD levels except Pro, mm-hmm. which still gets the Fox. That's been a thing since 19. Um, yeah. Fox went in the TRD I mean, Pro and, starting and in 19. I like that. And not just Fox, but Fox Adjustable. Fox Adjustable, which was TRD not a Pro. thing. Yeah, now it is a thing. No. So that's nice. <laughs> So it's an inter- yeah, it's an adjustable nice. internal bypass. Great shock. I, I, oh, I'd yeah. be hard pressed to change them. I really would. Um, yeah. And then the new Trail Hunter trim is going to get OMEs, which is mm-hmm. pretty slick. That's pretty slick. Um, it's it, that's I feel like it's going to ride pretty, pretty cool. Thing. Well, I think so. I think so. And yeah. I think it's going to do what the Trail Hunter um, is kind of meant to do. And you know, in keeping with the differences on the stand on the premium versus the TRD versus all that. Um, platinum and limited get have the available like power steps they've got um i mean they've got they got different shocks and struts which will be they've got that um new adaptive ride control stuff um you know where it's not something you have to select they do have the multi-terrain select in certain models but like the platinum and the limited have that adaptive stuff where the computer just kind of takes care of it for you and like we're riding we're riding in style so that's going to be a real nice kind of carpool line vehicle um yeah, I think that's well, and like be we've really said nice. before, for for the ninety percenters, I mean that's mm-hmm. that's checking a lot of boxes oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. for people, especially even going back to our last episode in the uh, in the Overland episode, uh, guys that are the new wave of of Overlanding, you know, it's a lot of tech centric, a lot of gear centric. Um, they're not they're not going heavy hardcore off road, but for something like that, you hit terrain select or let the computer figure it out for you and you just bomb through gravel roads and you're still as plush as you can be on the highway. It's kind of hard to argue with that. <laughs> well, but then they added some stuff like TRD never had like the, um, Oh, the, the, the auto tailgate where you can like wave your foot under it and the tailgate mm-hmm. comes up. That was, not, yeah, it is now you can get that now. It is now, you know, they've mm-hmm. got heated and cooled seats that you can get. They've got, um, help the Jeep didn't even have that. Now Jeep says they have a reason for that, but whatever that reason is, Toyota, you know, the Forerunner now has that available um to you, and they now have a sway bar disconnect. So like, yeah, so that's one thing I wanted to mention. I can do too. the cool thing on the and tailgate, also, you, but I can also disconnect my sway bar. Like that's cool, right? 
And did you also catch that the, and I know this isn't a big deal for most people, but it's been a complaint that I've had either in my Grand Cherokee, because that's my daily driver, and Brittany's 4 by 8 which is fully loaded, is that the rear seats are not heated or cooled. Right. And they actually made a point to say that the heated and cooling function extends to the rear seat, yeah. which I thought that was pretty awesome. I but think that's what, I do want to get on, into. Um, that's Platinum and Limited, <clears throat> right? The platinum and limited trims, yeah, uh, I saw for that. the leather, yeah, the outboard rear. Uh, but seats. I do want to get into the sway bar. I think they're calling it um, their stabilizer disconnect right. system. Yep. Um, but as soon as I heard that, I was like, "That's a sway bar disconnect." <laughs> so good on them for taking a page out of out of Jeep's book and saying, "Hey, yeah, we can get you a little more travel and get you a little more, you know, just go fast off road." Uh, without being super limited there. Um, so yeah, one button disconnect, um, just adding to the list of, of check which marks also here means, that I like. <laughs> which also means, I think, death to the X-ray system, which is yes. the hall. <laughs> no more x rays and none more of that. Uh, oh, man, I can't remember the abbreviation, but their, their sway bar link, that hydro system, um, mm-hmm. freaking, I hated them. I hated it. As as far as off road goes, you just man, I didn't like it. Uh, I was not a fan at all of it. Um, no. Well, then trying to build a, an aftermarket suspension around that um, because if, the minute you disconnect that, the whole system freaks oh, it's out. Terrible. Um, and trying to find a a suspension system that works with that, and then still, you know, people see thirty fives as kind of a new standard mm-hmm. now, um, and. Forerunner and Toyota guys, or Forerunner guys especially, were were looking at that and were like, "Hey, I'd, I'd love to have 35s." And you're like, "Yeah, sorry, um, it's going to be difficult if you have that in your in your system." Right. Well, I'm glad it's gone. There was no mention of it. It was not talked about. I didn't see anything in any of the pictures, videos. I'm happy that that has now died a slow death. It is gone. So I'm I'm happy about that. Um, I will say the um, I did notice on the Trail Hunter, which is the new model. They've never had a Trail Hunter before, right? There is the Trail Hunter in the, um, or Trail, whatever they call it, in the Tacoma, which was introduced. Um, and in the Forerunner, it's, it's a little bit different. So you've got, the, you've got a little bit of a factory lift. Uh, they didn't say how much it is, but I'm going to assume it's right around that inch, inch and a half mark like it usually has been. Um, the OME shocks, which we already mentioned, it comes with a roof rack now. So the Trail Hunter is going to come with a roof rack. It is also going to come with a snorkel. They call it a high mount air intake, whatever. It's a snorkel. Uh, mm-hmm. on the passenger it's side horrible. and then that what it shares with the trd pro which i think is really cool is a light bar in the grill mm-hmm. i think that's cool i think that's a cool little upgrade from the factory something they can do without you know modifying a lot of stuff i think that's a really cool thing to do i'm sure there'll be aftermarket options especially in the lower trims that don't have it to try to get that light bar look i, I think i'm just go ahead and bank on it now there's going to be people who grill swap to do the TRD Pro or the Trail Hunter Grill with that light bar, it's going to happen. Oh, absolutely! Like, just know that's going to happen. Absolutely, and um, and I think it's going to be cool. I'm there. For, I'm here for it because I yeah. think it's a really good looking front end. I did notice they brought in that that horizontal, like four or five light horizontal fog mm-hmm. light, mm-hmm. like you see in Tundra. Yeah, um, I think that's cool. Um, it's LED. You know that is modernized. That is updated. That is not something they had, not really had in the Gen Four and Gen Five. Not at all in the Gen 5. So I like to see that kind of the modernized look with the LED lights. I like that. Oh, yeah. Um, that, was, that was pretty nice. So, and of course, to all you Toyota enthusiasts out there, yes, 100%, all trim models keep the rear power window in the tailgate. It's there. How to have the it's rear power there. window? Look, man, the Toyota people, like, that was something I was like, man, I hope they keep the power window. Like, you got to have the power window. They want that. And yeah. it's, you know, it's you ingrained take the dog into the, somewhere, the whatever, Forerunner you know, DNA the dog now. Could, it, it were, I think so. I think so. I think it has to be there. I think it has to stay. Um, so that whole, so you got all that stuff in the front, but you got the power lift gate in the rear with the hands free. You've got, you keep that power window. Um, I like, I saw some people kind of griping about the lines on the rear bumper. I kind of dig it. I kind of like it. I kind of dig it. The first time I saw it, I was like, man, that's weird. But now that I've watched that video and looked at all the pictures multiple times, I'm like, this whole body style thing is starting to grow on me. Um, yeah. Well, one so thing I, I noticed. I, I can't say I dislike it. Yeah, one thing I noticed, and I think if the frame allows for it, <laughs> it's got the look that in the aftermarket community, I'm sure someone's going to design something. Uh, I forget how they call it. I know it's not dovetail because dovetails bring it in. Um, but for like the Baja style trucks that 
actually slant upwards towards the back mm-hmm. of the bumper. It's got that line naturally built into it. And I Dude, wonder if we cut that. I think we could cut along that line, <laughs> add a piece of trim, and it's like a rear viper cut. Yeah. I saw that. Re- viper I did cut. See yeah, that. that's kind of rear what I was viper thinking. cut. Yeah. And I would not Depart be surprised triangle, if, if someone in the aftermarket, yeah, it, it drastically increases yeah. departure angle if the frame allows for that. And that would be a sexy line to cut on, too. I'm betting like, you, mm. since it's multi link coil spring, I, I don't think the frame will be the problem. I think it's did they put anything behind there? And I, if they listen to their customer, I'm going to be interested to see if there's something behind there that would prevent us from basically just cutting that. Or is it only there as an aerodynamic thing where they put it there and they put that line there maybe on purpose? I wouldn't think an OE engineer would do that for us. Um, but weirder things have happened. But I did see that line. Um, and when I first saw it in the leaked picture, so, you know, for those that know, Forbes actually accidentally released their article 12 hours like, early the other day. Yeah. <laughs> and people weren't supposed to see it. And by the time they realized it, ah, too late, the interwebs got you, buddy. So everybody had these pictures. And when I first saw the pictures, I saw that line on the rear corner. I was like, is that a separate piece? Is that, like, removable? And a lot of people thought it was. And then when I got closer, I realized it's not. It's just a – it's a compound line. It's, it's molded um, in, yeah. But I think that could be – I'll be interested again. I'll be interested to see what's behind it to see mm-hmm. if that is something available to us where we could kind of cut that, increase our departure angle, kind of give it that that rear viper cut and see and see what we could do there. I'd be I'm, you know, I'm interested to see. So I'm definitely interested to get my hands on one. We we didn't know that Jeep would do that. And Jeep turned around from the manufacturing and gave us basically everything except the words cut here. Uh, yeah, that's the true. Flares. That's true. They did. Um, that's true. And pinch seams like th- there were molded lines. in. if you follow those lines like that, that's exactly where it needs to go. And obviously the Rubicon model got the separated fenders. But the other ones like you can take just literally a, a razor blade and cut through that yeah. material. It's very. Thin. I hope so. I mean, I, um, there's some Jeep is definitely more kind of populated in the engineering department with enthusiasts than I think Toyota would be. But. You know, I do think Toyota engineers are smart, and I want to give them credit. So I'm gonna, I'll reserve judgment on that. But it would be really, really nice if that was a thought. That would be really cool. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Move. Let's move on to the inside because there, that is the big gripe. I think other than power, right? Like that was a huge gripe that you got in it. And even even a 2024, if you get in a 2024, it's like a time capsule back to 2011, 2012. And that was my big complaint. Like you got to get your interior right. Like that's. Like exterior is cool, but when I'm driving it, I don't see the exterior. That's for somebody else. Exactly. You know, the exterior matters for two only really only matters for two things. Other other people see because you're not outside of it driving. And then kind of the look back, you know, that look back thing. You know, when you park your car and you walk inside, you kind of look back and and it should. It should make you want to look back. I think it should have that that level of aesthetic. You should like the car that you drive. I think as a you know, I get that there's two sectors, car enthusiasts, of which I definitely consider myself. And then there's people that just look at them as transportation. If you just look at your vehicle as transportation, you're not listening to this podcast anyway. And we're probably not friends. Right. <laughs> as an enthusiast, I think that you should want, I think that you should have that feeling for your vehicle, that a vehicle can be an extension of you. It's, you know, it's a large, it's a large investment to buy a vehicle. Why not make it an extension of yourself, make it something that you like and kind of be in love with it, quote unquote, to that extent where you're like, man, I just really like I really like my vehicle. I really like it. I kind of want to get that that look back when I leave. I, you know, I think that's a thing. So, but other than that, the exterior is not a a massive thing. But you definitely spend more time in the interior. And kudos here. Uh, most of my notes that I made on that video were interior related, right? I mean, they just were. So, but you know, jumping into the interior, um, first off, is the seats. We've got. There's a lot of different trim levels for what the seats are made of. Yeah. Um, still fabric on a lot of the trim models. Uh, SR5, TRD Sport, TRD Off-Road. So kind of the lower. You got TRD Sport, TRD Off-Road, and then TRD Pro. That's your three TRD mm-hmm. models. Um, so the Sport and the Off-Road get cloth. And the SR5, which is the basic, that's your entry level, that's your standard model. Um, across all Toyota, uh, anything that could be considered off-road, you know, your Tundra, your Tacoma, and the 4Runner. SR5 is your base model. So those get cloth. Um, on the plat on the premium trim, so the limited and the platinum, you've got the you've got the leather trim seats. You're getting a heated steering wheel. You're getting heated and ventilated front, and you're getting heated, what they say, outboard rear. So the the driver and passenger rear, that sixty forty split bench, um, is heated. The center is not, but I don't know of any outside of absolute luxury vehicles. You're not going to get a heated, um, 
center section and you're not really going to get ventilated centers unless you're in luxury so at this price point that's yeah. pretty good unless you're trying to pack five I, I people think. into the vehicle at once right i never yeah. used the center section of, of my grand cherokee my grand cherokee is yep. a, a limited so it's got leather everything heated seats in the front cooled all that good stuff but yeah in the rear um more times than not the armrest is down with the cup holders right um and if you're so. using the three in the back that's generally kids mm-hmm. and you know i i don't really care if the kids get a heated seat like, they can grow up get a job <laughs> by their own vehicle heated seats. <laughs> Right. Um, that's just, that's just my thing. Um, I did think that in some trim models, the upper trim models, they got the digital rear view. I see that coming in a lot of vehicles. Now, first vehicle I had with it was weird. <laughs> it was weird. Um, now I look for it. Yeah. Like, I think it's cool. I think a digital rear view mirror is, is very cool. It's, yeah. it's a safety thing, right? It's part of the safety thing. It eliminates any obstruction. So like in a Jeep where you have the big spare or, or even in forerunner. In any vehicle where you got the rear headrest in your way, there's a lot of stuff between that mirror right in front of your face and what you're wanting to see out back, and they're all obstructions. And when you can do a camera and you can mess with the lens and you can add degrees of vision and field of vision and all that, I think that is a great use of technology yeah, when it absolutely. comes to vehicle safety. I like Eliminating it. blind spots, for sure. And the more I get used to it and the less weird it kind of is to my equilibrium, um, the more I like it. So I, I, you know, I dig it. I think it's a great thing. And I, you know, I hope that more vehicles go to it. So, um, Oh, two, two more models about the interior trail hunters gets this new, um, soft text, which I'm assuming is like that, that vinyl stuff that's in mm-hmm. like the Fords and what, what they have now, um, which is not really a leather, but it's also not cloth. It's more washable, more durable, can hold up the stuff, you know, you put pets in there, you put crap, you know, wet stuff in the towels, whatever. I think that's going to be there. And then um, the TRD, I think is also soft text, but where trail hunter gets, I think it's like an, it looked orangish to me on the accents they have. It looked a little orange where the trail hunter is orange. The TRD pro gets all red stitching, mm-hmm. um, which has been a thing before red has been there. Yeah. That TRD pro accent for a while. But now it gets in the in the upper section of the seats, the center of the seats like that between your shoulder blades. They're calling it technical camo, which commonly yeah. looks like an urban digital camo, I which I it. was like, dude, <laughs> that is cool. I, I thought that it. was cool. Good on Toyota for adding that. I loved it. Yeah. And they did that with the Tacoma as well. And that was one mm-hmm. of the things that I saw with the redesign of the new Tacoma that I was like, I don't love it. But I love that. <laughs> I love it. I, I dude, I'm a hundred percent on board. I freaking love it. I love the red interior accent. I freaking loved it. I think that um I heard somebody call it Taliban Tan. The uh, <laughs> the FDE color. They said, Man, I want to get me one of those in Taliban Tan. I about died. I was like, Man, I've never heard it called that before, but but I, mean, I but love that accurate. color. <laughs> that nut that other kind of greenish color. I think they're calling it Cypress. Mm. Um, whatever yeah. they're calling that is the wife liked it. She looked at it. She's like, mm, I kind of like that green blue, you know, color. And I'm like, I like that FDE color. And she's like, well, I don't like that. And I'm like, well, I guess we're going to, so, <laughs> but I loved it. I think the interior of the TRD pro was definitely my favorite. The trail hunter looked pretty cool with the orange accents. I know mm-hmm. some people that like the orange and they're probably going to look for that. Um, but I really like the red stitching with that technical camo instead of just having, you know, black seats with red stitching, which has kind of been the MO for a while. They threw a little extra dimension and design in there, and I I absolutely love it. So um, that for the interior, all in all models from SR5 all the way to the most premium, the rear seat is a sixty forty, and it comes down. It folds flat on its own, but it is not flat with. And, and I'm guessing they just can't do this. It does not fold flat with the rear cargo area. Um, what it doesn't do is like what what Jeep does, where it kind of folds down and makes like this weird kind of that it doesn't do that it looks like it goes the cargo area and then like that for the rear seats it goes up at a 90 it makes like it's like Mm -hmm. a step up uh and it looks to be about seven or eight inches or so um so they do fold what they call fold and tumble so the seats do fold and tumble flat on their own it just kind of creates this shelf above the cargo Mm -hmm. area um and then in the cargo area i think there was two trim levels that you could get uh sr5 and limited only you could actually get a third row um, so for those that want a third row, um, and still have some cargo capability with folding down the third row, um, cause I assume the third row will not fold flat either. I, I can't see that. Being yeah. A thing. Most likely, not. most likely it doesn't in this generation. I can't think it's going to, 
Um, but there is going to be that third row available for people that want it, um, which I think that's nice to be able to give that option. Um, I can kind of see why they wouldn't put it in the TRDs. I get that. And why you yeah, put it in a limited, not needed. You're, you know, not, you're not wheeling. In I can a, see it. Three I, rows. I get why they did that in the SR five. You can get a base model, but you can have the third row. And I get why they did it in the limited versus the platinum. They did it in the limited. Cause you can get that, that grocery getter, that mall crawling forerunner, but you can also, I get it. I absolutely get it. Yeah. Um, well also that, that gives you the people who are in between the forerunner and a Sequoia will probably gravitate towards that third row without paying the price of a Sequoia yep. or driving a school bus. Yep. Let's be honest. The Sequoia is they're huge. Big. It's they're a beautiful with, with cool. a, with a cab. Yeah. They're beautiful. Uh, they are beautiful, but they're expensive. They're in the, the, the top a- line Sequoia is in the price range with a grand wagon Absolutely. right now. There was, um, we priced them out. And before we bought the wife's expedition, which still wasn't a cheap vehicle because it was an expedition limited stealth, but we looked at the Sequoia and really the only reason we didn't get the Sequoia, because there really wasn't a lot of availability out there to go test drive a TRD pro. I hadn't driven, one of the new Sequoias, because it's not something that we really see a lot of. And, you know, when she got in the expedition, she was like, I don't need to test drive anything else. She couldn't get adaptive cruise in the Tahoe model she wanted, which was really what she wanted. Love the Toyota. I like, I actually like the Sequoia better than her expedition. I wish that she would have gone with the Sequoia TRD Pro. But, you know, she said, oh, you know, I'm not really, you know, this isn't a, this isn't a forever vehicle for me. This is where we had the Forerunner talk. She's like, I know the Forerunner's coming. I know mm-hmm. it's coming. Yeah. You know, I just want She's something for one. a year or two. I know the <laughs> forerunners come and, but you know, we got it. Like we talked about with the market and having it look like it can do stuff. We got the stealth. It's all blacked out. It's the, you know, that's on the expedition, everything interior with the red stitching, all that stuff. You know, that's where the market's at. So, and she doesn't off-road that thing. It's never going to be off-roaded, but yeah, I like the Sequoia. And I do kind of think that everybody was thinking that the forerunner was just going to be a baby Sequoia. And I don't think it is. I, know, I don't it's, think it's, it is. I think it's its, it's, its, its own, own design. Yeah. I, I, I definitely see some sequoia but i don't think it's because of sequoia i think mm-hmm. it's just the overall design uh that 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 toyota is going yes. towards you see it in yeah. the grand the new grand highlander you see it in the tacoma you see it in the sequoia you see it in the tundra but i don't think they bet i you know i think a lot of people were like well i think they're just gonna take the sequoia and shrink it i don't think they did that here i really don't No, uh-uh. i think it was just a natural they've got their unique yeah they've got their unique design style lines every single toyota across the board has sharp aggressive lines now. Yeah, exactly. um and that's that's really the only thing that you can compare head to head with the new forerunner is a sharp aggressive design style everything else i think the forerunner honestly stands on its own I, I, um, I agree with that. but what i'm also looking at for the interior is the technology dude um <laughs> Talk i'm, about I'm it. kind of a tech Talk guy about I, it i love cameras i, I love having things and now this is kind of weird coming from the guy who also owns a 2004 wrangler uh with zero Man, technology but ride. that's one of the reasons why i picked the grand cherokee especially the limited version for my daily i've got plenty of usb outlets i've got a huge 8.4 screen i've got everything i want i've got backup camera i've got i mean the backup camera is like crystal clear on the thing um it's got a built-in inverter so i can use an actual power block or brick or you know an actual plug-in which i've ran a, a fridge freezer off of so those are things that I'm looking at. And in that price range, that's something you would expect. And Forerunner finally delivers on that. Well, shoot, so yeah, man. we're looking at multiple USB and USB-C ports. We're looking at a huge, beautiful, sexy radio screen. 14 like, inches, man. Phenomenal. 14 inches. Whew. You've got, that's look, a Tesla I'll just screen. go through it. Like, look at that. They've got, <laughs> they've got an aux switch panel that's available, just like you have in the JL yes. on the center low. They've got it on the driver's side, kind of right above the knee kick panel. You've got that available. You've got an eight inch standard screen. That's the standard 14 inch center screen and wireless CarPlay with Android with Android Auto. Welcome to the 21st century Toyota. Absolutely. Five, count them five USB C ports. Again, welcome to the 21st century. Three USB C in the front, two USB C in the rear. There are no USB A. That tech is gone. Toyota acknowledges that. It is USB C everywhere, it's just better technology. It is technology mm-hmm. that's being used all over the world now and mandated even in certain in certain countries. So good on your Toyota for doing that. There's an availability of a 14 speaker JBL audio system and they have the JBL Flex Bluetooth speaker. So it's plugged in. It's kind of the center channel. You can pull it out. You can take it. You can link it with other ones. You can do a little surround sound at the campsite for the overlanders, all that kind of stuff. So audio has a big, big jump available to you. There is an available, which I really like about what Ford has now and Chevy has available at 12.3 inch driver instrument cluster so you can go away from kind of the analog cluster to get a full fully customizable 
program it how you want it to an extent, driver instrument cluster with available heads up display. Who would have thought that a freaking Toyota 4Runner would have a over a foot wide instrument cluster and a heads up display? Like I would not have seen that. There's a tow technology package. They've got they've got surround sound cameras. They've got the terrain cameras. They've got all that stuff. It's got a six thousand pound tow capacity. Phenomenal. Like that's more than Bronco. <clears throat> that is more that's than Bronco. More than that's more than JL. Yeah. That's that's getting up into gladiator. It, it's and, getting close. <laughs> it's getting like close. You can pull a few things. Yeah. Now, granted, some of that's because they stayed coil spring rear. It's multi link. They got the body on frame. Like there's a lot of that. A lot of that is the reason. But 6,000 usable pounds and then stuff to go along with it. I mean, man, you talk about technology. Heck, even the iForce Max has an inverter on it. Yeah. 2,400 watt AC inverter. Yeah, that's... Talk about running a fridge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, no power dude, issues there. That's awesome. Like, I mean, that's just awesome. And good on Toyota for doing that. When they say, when, I, when we, when we kind of headed this off at the top, talking about the, you know, ultimately modernized or whatever... I, that's a lot of what we're talking about here. And, you know, we talked a little bit about safety with the rear view. They've got what they call now Toyota Safety Sense 3.0. And you can Google that. There's a bunch of stuff. But to me, the things that stood out about that, which is standard across all models, all models, all models get Toyota Safety Sense 3.0, That's awesome. which is automatic high beams. That's mm-hmm. not something you see in low trims on the competition. No. They've got lane departure with steering assist. That's not something. I mean, I turn mine off, but it's got it. Adaptive cruise on all models. Dude, it is not something you're paying for. (laughs) It's huge. That's standard. Yeah. And you've got blind spot monitoring on all models. So, you know, in true Toyota form, they take safety seriously. They take safety and reliability seriously. And it looks like that has like that is done here. Now, again, I will, I will conclude my thoughts by saying this. No, I've not sat in one. I've not seen one in person. We're going off in, you know, we're not really inferring a lot here. This is all straight. Everything we've said is straight from Toyota and then stuff that you can logically surmise based on the stuff that we've got. Um, I think this is just, this is not a, I don't see this as a completely new vehicle. Toyota says it's a completely new vehicle. I see this as welcome to the 21st century Toyota. They, they massage the outside a little bit. I don't see a massive, massive redesign on the outside. And that's not a negative. That's a positive. The massive, massive redesign comes to the interior, which is where it needed to be. It needed new powertrain options. It got them. That was the top two things you and I talked about at the top of this episode was the two things that we didn't like. It needed a powertrain update. It got it. It desperately needed an interior update. It got it. And then it got a lot of other tweaks. You know, they added the Trail Hunter. They've added some stuff that we haven't traditionally been able to get in the Toyota before and in the TRD line, especially the TRD Pro. They added some stuff that we were not traditionally able to get. So I think overall, um, I'm happy with the release. I am looking forward to seeing one. Um, I'm I'm sure there'll be some stuff that we get in one. We're like, "Ah, I wish it was this, wish it was this. But you're never going to please everybody all the time everywhere. It's just not going to happen. But I think by and large, I I think this is 80 to 85% positive, um, which I think is huge. I think it does put a little bit of a scare into Ford. Because mm-hmm. of the competition with the Bronco and the Explorer, more the Explorer Timberline. So I think that is going to go right after Explorer there. Um, I think it is going to go right after uh, it's going to kind of put a chokehold on Honda with what they're trying to do with Trail Sport. Because now Honda's sitting there going, man, we just came out with the Trail Sport. Now here's Toyota. Dang it. We were just starting to sell some vehicles. <laughs> I think it yeah. is going to do that. I think it is going to put a little bit of a uh, of a notice on Subaru. Um. I do think it, you know, I don't think it's going to take a lot of market share from Bronco and Wrangler, maybe a little bit more from Bronco just because of what Bronco's marketed to, but Jeep has definitely changed their marketing and increased sales as a result to a different market that Forerunner has traditionally already had. So I don't think that Jeep's going to lose market share versus they're going to give back some of what they took. Yeah. I, th- I think that's kind of my takeaway from that, but overall for me, um, very positive. I see a lot of positives. I do think they listen to a large extent to their customer base. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm having, I'm, you know, final, final judgment withheld, but I'm leaning, I'm leaning, I'm leaning all positive. Yeah, absolutely. And for me, um, as someone who has test drove forerunner, but not ever loved it enough to buy one, I think for the first time, 
this is a vehicle that not only am, uh, would I consider buying, like I'm excited to go test drive one now. Like I, I'm excited to get my butt in the driver's seat and get a feel for it, um, which I can't say I've ever been excited for in the past for, for, for a forerunner. As long as you buy the um, It's always been, yeah, it's a forerunner. You have you know, to buy the talent but, in tan. But but now I think for the first time I'm like ooh I'm I'm excited like I want to go I want to get in one. What color would you like? Your, what what, yeah. what would be your color choice? I'm dude mm. I am down with the FDE. <laughs> that thing. I'm down with the FDE ooh. too. I ooh. like it. But I will say, so good. I don't know what it is, but if if that teal color comes out in in some aggressive coloring options, like that teal color is kind of cool. So <laughs> it is coming. It's called Everest. Mm. Right now like it. It, it could change, but right now it's called Everest. Um, so I think, um, Everest, I think it's Everest, but it's that greeny tealy color. Um, Mm -hmm. they didn't show a lot of colors in that video. Um, and I assume when talking to my wife about it, I was like, you know, just be ready because TRD pro has been notorious for having limited color options. It's usually been black, white, uh, maybe a, maybe a silver and then one special color, you know, so three or four colors are going to max it out. So, we do know that FDE is going to be a color in pro because you can tell the pro by the black painted fenders, the hood thing. You, you could tell that from a distance. So I could tell that at that FDE color, that what, that what they call it, Sandstorm. There was a couple different colors that Toyota called it, but it was basically with minor tweaks. It was that same quicksand, I think, was one option. Um, but it was basically flat, dark earth. So it, I could definitely tell that that FDE color is coming. It's going to be one of the TRD mm. pro colors. I don't think they would For release sure. that. Um, but I did not see that green Cypress Everest color in TRD Pro trim. I didn't Correct. see Correct. I think that's probably going to be more of a limited I think platinum, so. I think so. Which is still fine. Um, but I, I welcome the bright colors. It's cool. It's cool to see some cool stuff out there. But, yeah. Um, and it, if I got a TRD Pro model, I think I'd have to go FDE. I think it's just it's so cool. FDE with the red oh. and the camo and inside looks, <clears> come on. looks pretty Come on. Hard. Now, my my last thing, do we have any inclination on where the price is going to land on these? Absolutely none. No, they haven't released prices. <laughs> I, I would assume, yep. um, I my guess would be about 5% above 2024. Yeah, I've heard some people think 10%. I, I don't think the market's going to bear that. I don't think you're going to be able to take a $60,000 truck and make it a $66,000 truck. Um, that's not to say Toyota won't do that, but I think model for model – I think you're going to see maybe up to seven or eight percent only because it is a redesigned vehicle and there's a lot more technology in it. But I don't think we're going to see a 10 percent hike. I think five that five to seven and a half, eight percent max. Yeah. I, I think it'll land at I five, think five to, to seven, six is where but we're I think initially it. it'll probably do what the Bronco did. I and I'm, I'm which I hate it. Uh, I wish this could be regulated and, and I'm really not one for government regulation, but that should Price gouging and markups should be a regular. But is the thing. price that gouging? That should not be a thing. So I, I struggle with that. Is that the fault of the dealer or is that the fault of us, the consumer, for paying it? Yeah, that's very I mean, true. If, if you, if everybody, in, if every customer said we're not paying markups, that's the reason markups went away because people got sick and tired of paying them and, and they bitch loud enough and they said, you know, it's capitalism at its finest. Like, okay, you want to charge 70000 for a $60,000 vehicle? You could probably do that for a little while. But the market remembers, and we're not going to do that forever. Now, I think it went on longer than it should have gone on. Um, but I don't know that I blame the dealerships. You know, they were selling less vehicles during and after COVID. They, there wasn't a big a supply. They were trying to make the money. They had fixed costs. I get all of that. I understand the principles of a free market system and capitalism. I get it. Um, I, I don't like it. <laughs> I didn't like it, but I understood it. And But I don't know how much I place the blame on the dealerships or – do I place it on the people that are going out and spending five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars over sticker um, for a vehicle? Because just because a sticker price is a price doesn't mean that's what you should pay. Like for decades, we were all used to paying under sticker. Sticker was just manufacturer suggested retail price. That is just the manufacturer saying, "Hey, this is what we think you should sell it for. You can sell it for more. You can sell it for less." We can't really regulate. It's a dangerous, slippery slope, right? We're getting into a different episode, but it's a slippery slope when you start regulating pricing in industry like that. And I don't think that's the way. I think the way is customer education, which I also understand is probably not going to happen. Um, so I think you're probably right. I think there are going to be some dealerships that try to go five to 10 over initially on certain trim levels. I think TRD Pro is going to probably be one of those. 
Um, I think Trail Hunter is probably going to be one of those. I don't think you're going to see markups on SR5s. Um, probably not limiteds, probably not platinums because those people can just go to another brand. But the people that are wanting a TRD Pro and a Trail Hunter are a very specific customer and they're probably going to pay it. I think there are some out there that are going to pay it. So I think it would not surprise me. And that's what I talked about with the wife last night. I said, look, you know, it's a 2025. And she's like, well, I just bought the expedition. I was like, look, don't think that we're going to go to a dealership in September or October and buy a 2025. It's not going to happen. Like, just, it's not going to happen. There's going to be a mad rush of people to get them. There may be, I hope there's not, there may be a markup. Like, we're probably looking at at least next summer before you can reliably see some on dealership lots, go drive one. Maybe you have to order a TRD Pro or a Trail Hunter. I think we're TRD Pro customers, I'm pretty sure. Um, so, I, you know, you're safe. You're not going to be getting out of your vehicle for at least another year, maybe 14, 15 months. Um, so when we looked at it from that yeah, context, I it agree. makes sense. So. Uh, I think there is going to be some craziness as soon as they hit dealership lots. Um, that, albeit, all that said, she did put her name on the list for updates about when they can order. So, <laughs> of course, she did. <laughs> on the off chance that it doesn't of get course. stupid, we will order. I, I, I'm sure we will. I, yeah. I don't have a problem with it. I think, you know, it's not my vehicle. Uh, I am not a customer for a midsize SUV. It's not what I do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I am a, I am a truck customer for being able to pull stuff, and, and I am a. I'm a Jeep slash Bronco customer because if I'm buying something that's going to go in a boot, that's going to go to show and you know, the Toyota, there's not, you know, there's a Bronco stampede, there's Jeep shows, there's Bronco shows. There's not forerunner shows and overland East and West don't count. Um, there's not specific. So there's really no reason for me as a company to go buy a forerunner and, and expect to get any kind of ROI for marketing and dev for us. Um, that being said, I have no problem with the wife buying one as a daily driver. No problem with it. At all. I'm I'm 100 with you there, and this yeah. is actually something that I could see um, Brittany doing as well, trading in the four by e, maybe on the Max, um, the iForce Max Hybrid, because um, I showed her some like rudimentary pictures as it was coming out, and she's like, "Ooh, I kind of like that." And I yep. was like, mm, "All right." <laughs> I think a lot of people are going to. I, I think um, I think it's going to do well yeah. for Toyota. I think. Just expect so. this is what you're going to see for the next 10 years from Toyota. This is the forerunner we get for the next 10 to 15 years, guys. So just yep. settle in. Like, don't rush to get a 2025. I guarantee you the 26, the 27, and the 28, they're all going to be the same. So yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> if you just bought Absolutely. your Wrangler and you're kicking yourself, or you just bought your Bronco, or you just bought a 24 forerunner, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. What I would do, though, is if it's something you're looking at, and – yeah, I wouldn't rush to get a 2025, but maybe 26, 27. Yeah, absolutely. And then if you did just buy a 24 Wrangler and you kind of like the Forerunner more, just put some, you know, add a little extra to your to your payment every month, put some equity into it so you get a good trade in for it, and pay it down. And then by the time bugs are worked out, yeah. it's available, pricing is is stabilized. You've got good equity in a Wrangler that already holds value, sure. and it's going to be a good trade in. And, and then so you're if you want to go from that point and make it's a smart decision from that point, yeah, to uh, to go from there. I think so. But I'm, yeah, I'm excited about that, man. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I am it. too. Um, you know, I'm I like pretty it. happy about doing this episode. When I texted you, I was like, "Bro, we got to do a video <laughs> on the video. Yeah. Like, we have yeah. to do it." And your Absolutely. immediate response was, "Yeah." Uh, duh, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course <laughs> Why did you text me? And that was like the night the video came out. It was like. 20, yeah. I'd already watched the video, like at the stroke of 10, 15, I'm watching the video. The wife was too. And immediately I was, I was like, in the middle of watching the video the when video. you texted me we and said, Hey, we got to do this. And I'm literally it. like watching the video. I'm like, yes, of course we got to do this. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to it. I mean, so. it's, um, I think that for a certain part of the market, this is equal to them when the, mm -hmm. out, or when the gladiator came out yeah. or when the Bronco, absolutely. Released. there's a lot of very excited people. And I get Jeep people going this or like, that's yeah, freaking forerunner. What's new for forerunner people. This is huge for overlanding people. This is huge for forerunner purist. This is huge, and I'd be interested to hear what some forerunner purists say about this because I'm not that. I'm not maybe a forerunner. You know, a guy that's been driving a forerunner for the last twenty years see something that we didn't see. I think this is an episode that can definitely get into the comment section. Um, yeah, I, and I, I welcome it. I, yeah. I want to see, but I would definitely say this is to the forerunner guys. Point. Yeah. I want to and see. I would say this is to the Forerunner guys yeah. what the JL was to the Wrangler mm -hmm. guys for the JK. It's such a huge up upgrade that it's almost a brand new vehicle, but not quite. And I'm glad it's keeping the Forerunner legacy and badging and name. Um, but definitely welcome upgrades. Welcome to the 21st century. Absolutely, I'm I'm excited to see this. I thing think this is more I'm like Bronco forward. people. Like Bronco people have gone so long without a Bronco, and Toyota people have 
go mm-hmm. on without a new new forerunner. Yeah. I feel like I feel like it was probably from 1978, the last time the a real Bronco. Right. They probably feel like it's been that long. But so, congratulations to all the Toyota fans out there, the ones that you that stuck by Toyota. Uh, this is your this is your time in the sun, folks. This is your moment. This is your time. Own it, love it, be excited about it. Um, you know, I look forward to getting into one and and seeing if if the if the product meets the hype. Um, but I, you know, I I think I think with every release, you're gonna see some stuff and go, man, I wish they did this. But I think by and large, like I said, 80 to 85 percent, I think it's mostly positive. And I'm looking forward to seeing them in person. I do trust Toyota to put out a good product. I don't think we're gonna have a vehicle that comes out with a lot of bugs. I do have that faith and trust in Toyota um to be able to do that they've been working on this for many many years now so i don't think toyota is going to put something out that's going to have a lot of reliability issues or a lot of warranty issues i just don't i just don't see it so i don't think this is one where i would say hold off a year to let them work out the bugs i think if you really when you can get one in the 25 I say go for it I say absolutely go for it um i think i would be a trd pro i force max guy e like we talked about but I could absolutely see some people going with, you know, the Trail Hunter or, you know, not the TRD Pro if you don't, if that's just not something you want to spend or, you know, the yeah. soccer mom. Going with I, the, think, the I think I would be in the Trail Hunter uh, iForce Max nice. category, to be honest nice. with you. Yeah. The, the, so, well, you, you get a roof rack, you got the snorkel. There is some Trail Hunter mm-hmm. badging. It gets its own unique interior accents. I think it's going to be cool. So I could absolutely see people going with the Trail Hunter version just for the stuff that it already has. So I'm excited for it. Yeah. Um, you know, we'll, we'll kind of, wait with bated breath and see i think we're expecting to see them deliver probably late fall would be my i'm gonna mm-hmm. say i'm thinking october november if if they follow the 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 idea of the tacoma with certain models being pushed into next probably the winter and into early next spring where the kind of right now we're just now mm-hmm. we're seeing tacoma trd pros on the lot finally uh in the last month or two yeah we're finally starting to see those and i, and I think they'll follow that again i think they'll follow that long with the uh with the forerunner so and that's okay i'm okay with that i'm fine with that but we'll see how that goes um but again guys get in the comment section on this one um i know this was a lot different episode but we kind of had to do it this way right for logistics we've already got our next several episodes of dirt to dust lined up and they are time sensitive the next three or four episodes are time sensitive we know what we've got to do we really didn't have a place to fit this episode in and we also didn't want to wait a month to have it come out so know that we right. didn't do a mailbag episode this week um we'll, we'll get back on it next week i promise but i felt that this was a video that was needed to kind of get the take on it and to dive a little deeper into that video i'm glad that we did it um so you know maybe we'll dedicate another mailbag episode to this with some questions on this but again please remember guys uh as always thank you for for watching thanks for spending a little time with us i know this was a little bit longer of an episode hopefully uh, it was good, especially for you overlanding and Toyota people. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe uh, on all the platforms you can find us. We are on Spotify. We are on Apple Podcasts. We are on Google Play. We are on theoutlawoffroad.com. You can go find the podcast there, the most three recent episodes. And then, obviously, we are on YouTube as well, where you can catch the video if you'd like to see us as well. I don't know why you would want to, but if you want to, hey, why not? Or you can just <laughs> listen to us on all those other platforms. So, Uh, Once again, for me, for Caleb Forbes, for all of us here at Dirt to Dust and Outlaw Off-Road, we thank you for stopping by. Hopefully you enjoyed the episode, and we will see you next week for another episode of Dirt to Dust. Peace out, everyone. Later.